Hey, you ready to grow your grandpa? Because that's what we're doing in growing my grandpa. Uh, this is a 2022 game. Came out last year. The developer is Yames. I've not played any of Yames' games. Um, I hear they're interesting. I'm just going to mention a few uh, terms that are on the Steam page for this game. Ahem. Point-and-click adventure. Virtual pet elements. Cronenberg-inspired. And body horror. So, uh, those are a few of the terms that you will see on the Steam page for Growing My Grandpa. And why don't we, uh, why don't we get started in this and learn how we are going to grow our grandpa? Would I like to view the tutorial about the basic game mechanics? I probably should. Don't want to grow our grandpa, uh, just willy-nilly. We need to know what we're doing. Okay, play with the mouse. That's what I'm doing. When pointing, I can interact with certain menu buttons and prompts. Second cursor, in, uh, hand extending all fingers. Interact with objects inside the world. Picking up an object, moving it to another position. Please pick up this trash. On the right. Like that. Okay, like that. Okay. I have it in my hand. Pick up on place it in the trash can in the left. Right mouse button will change the cursor's mode, but when holding something, mode cannot be changed until the cursor is not holding something. There we go. Many situations in growing my grandpa that will require me to pick things up, place things, grab things, give things. Don't be experiment. Keep an open mind about using your hand. Oh, I have to change. Okay, so pointer, grab, pointer, grab, pointer. To expedite the cleaning process, I can use digits 1, 2, 3 to reposition the trash can. Move that trash can anywhere I want it to be. Variety of yeah, video options. Uh, we can change the shader effects. You might notice like the text is wiggling. That's the shader. We can also change the, the resolution options. We're, do we're just going with full screen. F5 is cursor types. Uh, where this is scaled up by a factor of two by default. Shader set to low. Yeah, I tried it on high, and the text was jiggling just a little too much. So we'll keep it on low. Hovering over the small question mark up here. An overlay related to available configuration options. All right. I hope we enjoy. So we're trying this out for an hour. How much can we actually grow our grandpa in one hour? I'm not sure, but let's find out. I excused Adrienne during music class today and spoke with her about her recent string of demerits. It was our first time meeting outside of our quarterly evaluations, and I believe it went well. I can certainly understand Mrs. Richardson's classroom observations concerning Adrienne's emotional state. She was, of course, intensely shy when we first met. As I understand it, she is similarly withdrawn in her classroom activities, and only speaks or acts when she absolutely much must. Some things she simply will not do. Instead of participating in mandatory group activities, she will sit alone and accept that she will receive a demerit. Wow, I can't, I can't imagine what what that's like. That that's hard for me to uh, <clears throat> picture in my my mind. Before the meeting, I read Mrs. Richardson's parent-teacher report, which allowed me to estimate some about Adrian's home life. The parents are well-educated and come from a prestigious background, but they lack time to properly nurture Ad Adrienne. She is often alone, and when she is not, the parents seem to not understand the importance of warmth and affirmation when dealing with someone so young. Having two parents of this reserved and icy temperament exacts an inhibition in a child. The child's imagination is subdued, but only ostensibly, for it eventually finds its way into regular life. I surmise that I would be able to reach out to Adrienne by way of make-believe. How are you liking your new house? You've told me you used to live close by, but it can still be a big adjustment. A new room? A new school? The basement. I like that. The basement? Yeah, there's a lot of cool stuff. Mom and Dad sent me down there. Your mom and Dad made you go? Yeah, but there's lots of cool stuff. Well, that's not why they sent me down there, though. 
Why did they send you down there? Uh, fighting. They were fighting, shouting. I came in to help and uh, they shouted at me. They said to go clean up downstairs, so I went. That sounds tough. Do they fight a lot? Not, no, well, uh, uh, it's all right, Adrian. Maybe you can tell me more about the basement instead. Okay, well, it was weird at first, the stuff down there, but cool. I found something living. Sort of. That's very interesting, Adrian. Please tell me more. By indulging her in her fantasies and stories, I was able to glean more of an understanding of Adrian's anxiety surrounding her home and parents. The symbols of Adrian's story seem to carry their own traumatic weight, and her exploration of the basement may very well be a vehicle for the conveyance of her anxiety. Whatever might come of our next meeting, whether she will engage in similar make-believe, I will set down her story here. Adrian's story begins with her delving into the basement with a trash receptacle and the goal of cleaning up. She discovered one of the walls was covered in plastic bags. She went to investigate, intent on tearing away whatever they covered. Here she goes. Trash bags, let's get them out of here. Okay, click on that. That goes back. Grab. In you go. Upon removing the plastic trash bags from the wall, she noticed the interior lining was covered in glass. Like a window, I offered. No, she said. Like a mirror. Reflecting inward towards the animal they covered. I gently asked her what exactly this animal was. Here is where the material reality of the story took a turn for the explicitly fantastic and imaginary. Upon her discovery of it, at her gaze, it grew, or extended, like a shag its shaggy hair itself. Hair like the fur of a dog, I offered? No, she said. Not the fur of a dog, nor the hair on her head. It grew out towards her, the animal's hair, reaching out. It was hard, standing almost straight like the hair on a brush. A bristle, I offered. Yes, she said. She was very afraid at first, but then very curious. I asked her what else was in the room. More things hidden away, she said. Things of Grandpa's as well. First she found a hidden passage under the stairs. Inside were strange dolls, magic objects, naked, faceless figures. I heard these cryptic utterances and merely nodded. In order to keep the game of make-believe going, I only pressed for details where I thought necessary. The faceless dolls could be a simple metaphor for the anonymity she feels in her own home. Uh, the hidden passage... I'm unsure what to make of that. The revealing of the concealed seems to be thematic in her fantasy. The door under the stairs is but one example. Can I touch? Maybe not. Alright, can we look for this door? Question marks. We don't know what this is. Let's look around. The darkness of the shadowy corner unnerves you. You cannot explore here without some form of light. Yes, we don't want to be alone in the dark. Anything over here? There's the trash pile. And question marks. And throw that away. Once she removed the panel and found the magical, hidden passage, she was very specific about what she took. She found a magic book, a magic doll, a photo of her late grandpa, and magic glue. A slouching doll. Its material is rough and coarse. Garbage. Throw away. Hmm. Uh, gotta throw away everything first. Business before pleasure. The business of cleaning up, of course. All clean. This space will not be dirty again until next week. F why would it be dirty again? No one goes here. Glue. It's all purpose glue. Photo of our late grandfather. Wow, wow, what 
tiny black eyes you have, grandfather. It's a big smile, though. Nice stash. Mr. PhD. On the reverse side of the photograph, there's more text. Good luck on your trip to the Urals. Stay warm. Papers crudely bound together to form a book. Eurasian Step Shamanism and the Fusiform Gyrus, interdis 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 Interdisciplinary Study in Sympathetic Magic, a dissertation by Jacob Hart. The impetus of this research was the recognition of a particular pattern in fragments of documents relating to magic and magico-religious practices. Numerous sources were drawn from, commentaries on laws relating to the banning of sorcery and necromancy, comp compilations of folk charms relating to love spells, her hagiographs of saints and their encounters with devils, the list spans many centuries and a great distance, from the Levant to the Khazar Khaganate to the border of the modern nation-states of Russia and Kazakhstan today. From this paper trail arose a consistent account about a certain form of magic relating to the binding of demons to a sorcerer's will. A demon called the Heaven of Needles, or the Angel of Needles, was known to be kept best by shamanistic keepers of, or wards who suffer from face blindness. Prosopanosia. Well, we've heard of that before, a long time ago. Whether by birth or through de developmental causes like a stroke or a head injury. As far as I know, the only known cure for that is to make uh, several people go through a, a game of death. Um, it's, it's like a weird... It's, it's complicated. It's complicated. It was known to be extremely effective but terribly dangerous, so much so that it became outlawed several times and was generally a popular scapegoat relating to unexpected death. The nexus of magico-religious meaning-making, sorcery regarding human-related desires, and the history and science of the neurological disorders related to the fusiform gyrus is where the subject of this dissertation will reside. I will outline further, and then analyze the historical sources I mentioned previously, and then I will go into the neurology of mystic and magical religious experiences. After that, I will detail my ongoing correspondence with a resident of the Ural Mountain region, who is an expert folklorist and keeper of traditions he claims have been passed through his extended family for generations. All clean! I interrupted to ask what she did with these magical, mis mysterious materials. Grow Grandpa, she explained plainly, and then without missing a beat, she continued on with her story. Feeling that this was a potent symbol, I stopped her again to ask what she meant. Somewhat puzzled, I did not understand immediately, she explained slowly. Grandpa lives in the cage in the other room, the cage behind the door. They grew people in the cage. Of course. Let's try the door. A hastily written note. Oh, I didn't uh, want to. I did not read that. Do I have like an inventory that I can? I click. I clicked on continue instead of read now. Note on experiment one out of four. One, for the sake of university policy and the health of any future career you hope to have, you will abide by the non-disclosure contract you have signed. Two, do not break the anthrop anthropoidic vacuum without my prior consultation and approval. Three, anth any anthropoidic form brought into the enclosure area must not be left unattended. When not in dormancy, the sample will attempt to take anthropoid shells. Please see shell notes for more on that. Four, the sample's exposure to some of our neuronal activity is unavoidable. However, the speed at which its desirous yield is produced and can be dampened by several precautions regarding libidinal and emotional urges. Keep conversation not related to lab work to a minimum. I like the phrase desirous yield. Need to remember that for the future. If you begin to suspect that you are developing attachments to your colleagues, contact me as soon as possible. Ritual behavior with the sample, trading, bargaining, will result in dismissal from the project. The precise mechanism of the exchange of symbols and gifts required for requested 
desirous yield is not known, and even then the anecdotal accounts of success are <laughs> ended in violent death. Regarding growth cycles, every time Whiskers regenerates and leaves dormancy, it is to be logged as a new propagation. The sample's bodily existence cannot be... i.e. a part cannot be cut from the whole, so there can only be one living propagation. Propagations are to be terminated after five weeks. Any further development puts us at risk. Termination procedures will be posted and followed with extreme care. With all of that out of the way, I want to welcome you to the project. Look forward to working with you, Dr. Hart. You know, I, I would I would hope that the the parents knew that this was down here. Seems like seems kind of odd that this has just been in your basement this this whole time. Beyond the door in the room, the cage was hidden, concealed in another cloak of inward facing mirrors. A hidden cage lined with mirrors. It is strange, almost poetic. The elaborate fantasy of self reflection, concealment, captivity. At the cage, she finally cast her spell. But it was confusing, she confided at first. She took the magic doll, the magic glue, and the photo of her grandpa. And she combined them, and she wished very hard. I can only assume that in this fantasy, her next wish would come true. In what child's story would it not? So here's glue. Particular human representation, generic human figure, grandpa, doll. Yep, let's glue these together. <laughs> Beautiful. A tangible symbol of intention and desire. She put grandpa in the cage, assuming it was part of the ritual. She was not clear on how it worked. What precise instruction she could glean from her grandfather's magic book was complicated by her reading comprehension. She wished with all her heart, and then she told me she waited a while for something, anything to happen. After that time, she began to cry. I cried really hard, she said. I wanted Grandpa to be back. I wanted my parents to stop being so mean. And it hurt me. It hurt me wish for Grandpa to come back, for my parents to be different. I could feel through the walls, and it felt me through the air. I asked her exactly what she meant. She could only repeat what she said. By this time, lunch was almost over. I said goodbye to Adrienne, and she left to rejoin her class. I always love to consider our conversation. I believe the storytelling strategy I have employed was not unfruitful, but I must probe deeper, if I can. Although I can be sure of nothing I interpret, the impressions I get may begin to help me get an idea of the right questions to ask. Knowledge we acquired this week has given us access to certain topics or keywords we can discuss with Grandpa. Wish. Consider discussing this when Grandpa emerges. And... Shell. Week 2. I met again with Adrienne in order to address her emotional outbursts in the past few weeks. It is our second time meeting, and while it is standard practice to have multiple sessions with a troubled student, as I assemble a report for the counseling department, I could not help but think, as we sat down in my office, that Adrienne already seemed to show a remarkable change in self-esteem and confidence, and perhaps my and Mr. Richardson's estimation of her as emotionally disturbed was erroneous. The paralyzing shyness and withdrawn attitude Adrienne possessed last week was not entirely diminished, but she seemed to hold herself differently this week. However, this only lasted as long as our conversation pertained to initial introductory pleasantries. When I began once again asking about her parents, her feeling regarding her ho new school and her new home, she quickly lost what new confidence she had gathered up and withdrew again into herself. 
So once again, I partook in some collaborative make-believe, but this time I was aided by the fact that I had managed to do some research into Adrienne's grandfather, and I had some insight into what she might actually be finding in the basement. Now, this may be overstepping my bounds some as a school counseling caseworker, but it was all on the surface of making Adrian comfortable and happy in this learning environment. In any case, I was able to dig up information regarding the grandfather by inquiring at the university in town. Not that I make it a habit of sleuthing, but I had a suspicion the grandfather was a professor there, or at least some sort of researcher, due to the fact that the newly constructed laboratory on the campus I drive by every day bears his name in memorial. He was some sort of anthropologist or linguist, or neuroscientist? I did not have to dig that deep before the scope of his work became dizzying, and I ran up against the limits of my undergraduate education. But back to the make-believe. What's your grandpa like? Is he a smart man? Uh, not anymore, uh, but I'm teaching him. So he's grown a good deal then? You've been feeding him well? Yeah, he, he's getting bigger, but he has a lot of room in his cage. He's still behind the bars? Yeah, well, he, he might be able to climb out eventually. There's this vent in the ceiling. Well, perhaps if he climbs out, I could meet him someday. Yeah, maybe, but he's not ready to leave. Uh, he can't take care of himself. I have to feed him, pick up after him. Ah, you store the food in your lunchbox? It's nice of you to share. He can almost talk. You can't speak with him? Uh, he doesn't doesn't have a mouth, sort of. But how do you feed him? He has, like, a, a mouth on the the outside, on his shell, or, or the stuff that's his skin. I'm a little confused. Maybe you can go through a typical day with your grandpa? Okay. I asked her to explain how exactly she goes about growing her grandpa, and Adrienne began another tale. According to Adrienne, in the week that she had passed, much had changed in the basement. Question marks? The thing's gone. Covering a vent. The hairy thing that was here before is gone. My lunchbox is empty. Seek out food for Grandpa! So it's not just the, the trash bag. We also have lunchbox and glue is still available. I should see Grandpa first. Wake Grandpa! It was scary at first, she said. The way he moved, the way the dull skin covered him. I wanted to interject, this somehow seemed inappropriate, but I kept listening. When I look at him, she continued, When I think about him, he grows and moves. It's like he's growing for me. So he's growing bigger now, I asked. Yes, yeah, she said. Bigger every day. This begins the actual growing part of growing your grandpa. Beneath the doll's burlap skin, the follicles knit together what resembles a proper person. Your grandpa. You are in charge of its cognitive development and diet until it's able to sustain itself. Currently, you are observing Grandpa. Please click the arrow back button below for re tutorial for your duties as caretaker. All right, <clears throat> let's get a tutorial. I can see a variety of options regarding growing Grandpa. Highlighted in red are objectives relating to feeding and teaching Grandpa. Important messages regarding Grandpa's recent activity will also appear here. I need to find a food and learning material until I can before I can move on to the next week. Some foods will make Grandpa happy, others merely content. Some food will make Grandpa disgusted to the point of nausea. Learning material is scattered through the basement. Seek out vocabulary cards intended to help teach English and basic anthropoidic concept formation. The options highlighted in red are related to navigating around Grandpa's enclosure. The Go to Grandpa option will let me perform all actions di directly related to Grandpa. Feeding, teaching, observing, etc. The Study Corner let me go over any documents I pick up. Okay, so there is a way to read the documents that we've picked up, because I didn't miss one. Good idea to learn about the work of the people who last occupied, occupied this space. 
The kitchen corner will let me search for food in the old refrigerator and prepare food for Grandpa if need be. I wonder what Grandpa eats. Like, it says food. Like, is Grandpa's food what we would consider food? Help button will play the tutorial. Can save the game. I only have one save file at a time. Exit game button takes me back to the main menu. More buttons may or may not appear depending on my development of Grandpa. Watch out! One final note, explore the basement at your leisure, but due to the entropic nature of clutter and trash, different weeks may allow you to find things I had not previously discovered. I never considered the entropic nature of clutter and trash. Let's look, it's not it's not me who's messy. It's not that I'm a slob. It's that as time goes on, clutter will just, you know, appear. I'm not doing that. It's entropy. Good luck. All right, feed Grandpa. We need zero out of two acceptable foods. Teach Grandpa zero out of two words taught. All right, got to find food and vocabulary cards. Trash. Trash pile. Corroded battery. It isn't really food, but Grandpa might eat it. Okay. Not the only thing. No, we can throw away some garbage. He might eat a battery. Oh, vocabulary card. We got hello. Teach Grandpa this word to read the notes of past educators. Make sure everything's cleaned up. All clean! B bulbous growth? Something appears to be growing from the wall! I take a closer look. Mm, that is bulbous, yes. It's a pulsating sack. The slimy membrane that is its skin seems to contain something. It might be able to be opened with a blade. And we don't have a blade, though. I mean, that's generally what I think when I see a bulbous sack. Hey, there's something in there. If only I had a blade. Okay, we still don't have a light source for that. The cabinet. Shra slouching under the weight of rot and refuse. We're so good at cleaning. Blueberries. Oh, Grandpa might like that. I don't know what Grandpa's tastes are like, though. I mean, I guess we're going to find out. Trial and error, right? Maybe Grandpa doesn't like blueberries. Maybe what he likes are batteries. of an acquisition. Before we began, he had us all cover our faces completely. An earthenware pot was... Uh, yeah. And on the inside, as we stole brief glances at it, we could see the interior was inlaid with mirrors. The... Uh, yeah, gave it small pieces of dough, spoiled food, chicken feed... Uh, uh, keeping it content. The keeper gestured towards the small bag where the food composted and told us n to be careful not to feed it any meat. I asked if the rotting food was enough to sustain it, how it might get nutrients from any of this. The keeper regarded me seriously and said it did not matter what it was fed. The act of feeding itself was what mattered. The act of feeding flesh is another act, however... He then gave me another series of grave warnings regarding not keeping any animal-derived foods near where I might be keeping it. Alright, so... Some... Advice? 
on that maybe we should not feed grandpa meat or anything that comes from an animal. Blueberries don't come from an animal. They can't seem to grab onto this or point. Well, maybe I don't have what I need for that then. Trash pile. Something about that painting looks strange. Search the painting. A folder full of radiographic images. I can examine it in the study corner. Trash pile. All clean. Fiberglass insulation. Grandpa might eat it. I don't know how we're differentiating uh, trash and something like that. I mean, if, we, if we're going to feed Grandpa fiberglass insulation, why aren't we just feeding him the garbage? <clears throat> trash pile over here. The waste here smells particularly strong. Simple paper doll. Construction of magic symbols, you say? <clears throat> All right. So... You go to Grandpa, study corner, kitchen corner. There was something that we got that, that look over documents. Uh, which is which? Oh, I don't, I, th I don't think we read this one. I have repeatedly called your homes to no avail, and so I am forced to leave this here for you all. I found William sitting in the corner of the enclosure area, seemingly severely concussed. Whiskers was gone, in none of its usual hiding places. I immediately suspected the worst. The project thus must be suspended for now. I am leaving up the usual mirrored coverings we use to keep the anthropoidic void sealed. I have done my best to lock up everything on such short notice. It's a hasty fix, but will require some time to find a more permanent remedy. I'm honestly hoping you do not find this note, as I intend to lock the house down too. I intend to race off to you to retrieve your lockbox keys. Do not worry about William's key. It and the rest of its equipment is almost certainly deep within whiskers now. I pray you do not enter this room. No matter how it may appear, William cannot be helped, and is almost only being kept alive as a means of continuing predation on the rest of us. I will say once again, no matter what state you may encounter William in, he cannot be helped. I have sympathy for the young man, I truly do. But I found on his person several photos of his late sister, which would imply certain risks he knew he was taking. Our extant research materials have now become possible liabilities, either criminal or professional in nature. So I have stashed them away. I believe I let you all know how I might do this if we were ever to experience an event such as this. I hope you all remember what I told you. So long then. Dr. H. Oh, maybe William tried to maybe resurrect a dead family member. Things, maybe things didn't go well. Uh, radiographs. We didn't look at this one. Can I not look at radiographs? I'm not seeing, like, a, an option to look. Well, maybe radio. Maybe we do something with it. 
maybe it's not something we read. Maybe there is something that we do with the radiographs. It doesn't seem like I can interact with them. Paper doll, I'm not getting the description of it, but it did say that maybe we can use it in like a ma uh, like a magical ritual. <clears throat> Educational posters. A set of procedures regarding disposal slash internment. Number one, the researcher will seal off the enclosure bars, ensuring minimal gas leakage during the later fumigating process, and then retrieve the burn barrel and place it near the enclosure. Two, allow at least 48 hours of time where the current growth cycle experiences no human-related stimuli. Do not enter the enclosure area nor any part of the basement. Ideally, you will not be on the grounds at all. After 48 hours, two researchers will enter the basement wearing their assigned mirror mask, mirror apron, and powered air purifying respirator. The research will use the vent system to fumigate the enclosure area. Wait 30 minutes and then use the fan system to ventilate the enclosure. Keep the fans running during steps 3 through 4. 4. Re-enter the enclosure area wearing your assigned mirror masks and aprons. The organism may or may not be in complete dormancy. If it is not in full dormancy, be assured that its capacity to act against you will be greatly diminished. With your assigned power drills, quickly remove any enclosure bars needed to access the organism. Pull them, put them aside for later reinstallation. 5. Put the organism into the burn barrel. Incinerate the organism thoroughly. Wait for any smoke to be properly cleared by the fan system. 6. Turn on the fans. One researcher will retrieve the nucleus from the ash and place it in the mirror box. The other researcher will sift through the ash and place any other substantial remains in the biohazard bin in the room outside of the enclosure area. The bin is locked for safety purposes. The code is 323245. The researchers will fill out a termination form and leave it for Dr. Hart. Biohazard bin. We can talk about this with Grandpa. All right, so when enough time passes and they have to dispose of the organism, that's how they do it. And then they retrieve the nucleus, nucleus so they can, you know, try it again. Our study corner is so filthy. Cashews. Grandpa might like it. It was said to pass from one family of steppe people to another, but pressed on its ultimate origin somewhere to the south, coiled in a bowl covered in incantations, buried upside down by a graveyard, a common late antiquity demon trap. The Keeper, an elderly man in failing health, was ready to expound on and on about the dangers of the organism. But I want to ask more pointed questions about the history of its acquisition. I was given curt responses that had a way of circling back to vague warnings. File cabinet number two. I can talk about Grandpa with Grandpa. And file cabinet number three. I remove the taped down fabric to reveal the cabinet's wooden bottom. Then we have a note regarding cleanup procedures. 
to my colleagues, I don't mean to be overly severe in tone, but Dr. Hart's work is very important, and the material we are working with is potentially very dangerous. I will be handing out a copy of this note as a reminder to everyone. I'm not trying to single any particular person out. We all have misconceptions about the nature of this project from time to time. With that out of the way, here are some things to keep in mind. One, the active growth must be thoroughly terminated via the correct procedures at the very least four weeks after dormancy is interrupted. It doesn't matter what you've done or haven't done regarding tests or procedures or how much the anthropoidic vacuum has been disrupted. We are not ready to go beyond four weeks at this point. A step-by-step -step guide determination has been posted by the enclosure wall. Please, please, please do not place the educational posters over this posting. They did. Two, do not disrupt the anthropoidic vacuum without Dr. Hart's prior consultation and approval. In case of any emergency where the vacuum is disrupted, put on your equipment and begin the lockdown procedure. Make an extensive note of when and how the breach occurred. Three, if you find the habitat empty, page Dr. Hart immediately, but do not attempt to speak with anyone else. This thing can get very smart. I'm sure you're all well aware of the stories we've heard on our acquisition trip. The greatest caution should be used when dealing with a potentially aggressive mimicry scenario. Please seek me out if you have any more questions. William. Well, from what we know, uh, William did not follow these instructions. Eventually, he, uh, he broke the procedure. Exoskeletons. Research participants, please take note. Each growth, form a, each growth from a cycle does not require a shell. But you may find the sample will often try and seize on something somewhat flexible it can grow into, along with any desirous yield it may generate, or else it will move from one shell to the next as it outgrows them. In the small amount of time I have spent with it in preparation, I have noticed that it tends towards human forms. However, we should keep a tight lid on the anthropoidic seal in order to be cautious before we begin to experiment with exposing a long-term to anthropoid stimuli, Dr. Hart. And the medical imaging device? Okay, and this is what we're using the radiographic images for. Propagation 21, day 19 after dormancy. Anth vacuum broken, yes. Term at 21 days. Intriguing results with regard to the mimic hypothesis. Like a participant entered a sealed chamber adjacent to whiskers, growth cycle number 21, which had been freed from the anthropoidic vacuum, constructed quite economically from plastic and broken mirrors. The first propagation's original earthenware vacuum was shattered during the move in. Between the two, there was a semi-opaque glass panel that allowed observation both ways. The human participant was asked to think of someone in the popular consciousness, fictional or no, and cogitate on their image, personality, face, if possible, voice if possible, etc. Our participant chose Jesus of Nazareth. How are you going to focus on his voice? You don't know what he sounds like. And with we, you probably should choose someone like Bugs Bunny. Everyone knows Bugs Bunny. Everyone knows what his voice sounds like. With weekly repeated exposures to the participants' imaginings, propagation number 21 began forming what resembled an anthropoid Nazarene in the fold of its spines. Previous human-oriented tests have always bore out a result that Whiskers would form an anthropoid team member, be it me or Dr. Hart or Gerald, and we assume that it was merely mimicking one of us. Dr. Hart has always contended the desirous yield, or the anthropoid reproduction whiskers creates when in contact with human beings. Okay, so we're getting a definition of the desirous yield. Has always been based on the conception and relation to the person through someone else. With this framework, the desirous yield is not actually a replica of a person, or if it is, it is only a replica of the fiction of a person generated in the mind of another. Well, in a way... Aren't we all just the fiction of a person generated in someone's mind? Makes you think. This desirous yield was not Jesus Christ, but the participants' image of Jesus, assembled from their religious upbringing, religious artwork, depictions in pop popular cultural, ex culture, etc. This radiograph was taken right before the destruction of the growth cycle, while Whiskers was rendered unconscious via fumigation. 
It seems like with every successive propagation, the stem cells in the organism work a little faster, but I'm not paranoid. It's technically deathless, yes, but we're burning up whatever knowledge it's gained when we incinerate it. I don't believe in magic quite yet. Alright, well. Propagation number two, day zero after dormancy, and anth the vacuum broken, yes, term at six days. We have taken to calling it whiskers, though of course some have interpreted it as hair or needles or quills, but whiskers is more accurate, as the needles are really more like supersensory follicles or spines. The nerve nests distributed throughout the morphology of these spines resemble those of genus Hydra, but have Mylian sheaths that are functionally the same as vertebrae. As we can see in the x-ray, each spine is laden with dense optical arrangements similar to compound eyes. The Hydra connection is assuredly worth investigating with regard for the organism's capacity for regeneration and anecdotal deathlessness. It's certain a robust, robust enough creature to inspire marvel that is not untinged with fear. What? Afraid of it? Why would anyone be afraid of this cute thing? Propagation 14, day 14 after dormancy. Anth vacuum broken, no. Terminated to 16 days. Exposure to mammalian forms, part of a series of zoomorphic influences, led to further understanding of the propagation's ability to simulate the somatic stem cells that constitute fully developed animals. I write simulate in the previous statement because examining the tissue of each propagation leads me to believe its amazing capacity for accelerated growth of vastly different forms comes from its cell-level mutability. And yet at no time does it function as the thing it becomes except in the sense that it mimics it. That is to say, when Whiskers is removed from dormancy and replicates a rabbit's morphology, it is not seeing from the rabbit's eyes or smelling from the rabbit's nose, but pretending it does, and doing a very good job of it. Propagation number five, day ten after dormancy. Anth vacuum broken, no, term at twelve days. This radiograph was taken at or around growth cycle number four. The strange thing about it was that the subject of the image was found nowhere near the enclosure. It's almost like a piece of whiskers fell off and scurried into the corner. I feel like we've learned a lot since then, but at the time I remember speaking about the morphology being weird, not even resembling any extant zoomorphic structure, besides uh, maybe a cuttlefish. Then I happened to open the thing up. Inside were all these little dead amoeba-like things, but they all sort of looked like they had faces. Faces that were just barely there. After I took the radiograph, I gathered it up and went to go through it in the biohazard bin. As I walked by the bars of the enclosure, I could hear Whiskers suddenly going wild, flopping around and grunting excitedly. Could it have smelled the cuttlefish thing? Would it eat its own... production? I guess it's technically flesh. This is beyond the scope of the project, uh, but it could be that without the stimulus of an active brain, or more specifically, a healthy and active brain, capable of face recognition and theory of mind, Whiskers began to pull whatever it can from the limited data available to it. Again, this is not our focus at this time, but I left a note for Dr. Hart, just in case he wanted to take a look. Okay, so now we're repeating. All right. Learning quite a bit of information about Grandpa. Not like we understand. We're just a little girl. We don't understand all these big words. We just want to clean the basement and free feed Grandpa. Speaking of feeding Grandpa. Let's see. Per the upper fridge. Lettuce. Alright. Doesn't It's not meat. Lower fridge. Banana. Brown banana. Prepare food. Soft fruit or vegetable. Let's give him a banana. An appealing item. Have some fiberglass insulation, Grandpa. It's roughage. It's good. For, it's good for. It's fiber is good for you. <laughs> Conceal. The insulation is concealed in the browning banana flesh. Can I do again? No. Can I feed him battery? No, I, I, I don't have, I need to combine it with something. 
All right, we have something for Grandpa. Feed Grandpa. Would like to view. Oh yes, okay. I'll I'll view feeding tutorial. This brief tutorial will go over the basics of feeding Grandpa via induction of my unprotected insula. Grandpa has simulated the production of tooth enamel to mimic a human mouth. It will need to be fed through this in order to properly learn and grow, as do we all. First, I need to select an item from the lunchbox. Just click on the lunchbox in the bottom right corner. The contents of the lunchbox will be displayed in nice food and bad food. Select an item from the lunchbox. Doing so will fill my hand with the item. Note that any food can be put back into the lunchbox by clicking on lunchbox with a full hand. Before Grandpa can be fed, it must judge the food by smell. Hover my hand above Grandpa's olfactory bulbs. If Grandpa is pleased, it will allow me to feed it. Most foods Grandpa will accept. However, getting Grandpa to consume other things requires some culinary deception. Yeah, I know. I, 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 I used to have a dog. Wanted to get a pill, like take a pill, you know, like you... The, the, well, I mean, the, the, a good way of doing that was to, like, put it in butter. Love, love that. Love that butter. When Grandpa was willing to be fed, hover my hand over its mouth and click. Grandpa will consume the food. Good luck on feeding Grandpa! Uh, uh, let me observe. M noting the movements, respiration, and general mood... Grandpa seems sort of sluggish and bored. I get the feeling it may be more content and readily cooperative once fed and taught a word or two. All right, let's feed. Grandpa slides over. There's the mouth. Click on the nostrils left of the mouth. Yeah? I mean, the I guess the bulbs with a handful of food. Give this. We'll accept it. There you go. Qu Although quickly consumed, the meal seems to be causing some indigestion. With a sudden lurch, Grandpa empties his stomach onto the floor. The contents pool together in front of the cage. Well, didn't like that. Did, did Grandpa not like the insulation or the banana? You see, I'm assuming the insulation... But do I know that? Do you, do you want some blueberries? He finds it pal palatable. What do you think of those blueberries? It was sufficient. I don't know how much food he needs. You will accept it. Sufficient. Battery? Do you like battery? He does not like battery. Okay. Lettuce? Oh, he's full. Okay. All right. Step away from the window set in the bars. Grandpa slides back. Feeding summary, 2x digestible food, 1x other. Uh, okay, 2 out of 2 acceptable foods eaten. I don't know why I wanted to combine, like, something inedible with something good. I don't- we didn't really get a reason for why we were doing that. But I combined insulation with banana and he vomited. Again... I'm not really sure if it was the banana he didn't like or the insulation. Could possibly be that he didn't like the banana. Vocabulary words. Hello. Yeah, let's look at the tutorial. Okay, teaching grandpa pronunciation and vocalization. Uh, will appear in the top left corner. Bottom right corner will be a pentagon that is divided up into eight sections. Section of the Pentagon will be highlighted briefly. Notification sound will play. Another section will be highlighted. Control a small round icon that sits above the Pentagon by using a map. I'm going to need some, like, I don't know, some, um, 
idea as to why a pentagon is appearing with an icon over it. Like, how is this teaching us the words? Ball is constrained to the limits of the pentagon. Goal is to keep my icon over the highlighted area and move it as the area changes sections around the pentagon. When I hold left click above the correct highlighted area, the icon will start to vibrate along with the simulated vocal cords and the letter of, current letter of my word will begin to turn red. Keep holding over the highlighted section and adjust my icon as it changes place. Soon the letter will become fully red. After every letter becomes red, Grandpa will proudly pronounce the word to me and it will be considered learned. Alright, let's see how this works. Teaching Grandpa words will accelerate its cognitive development, lead to further breakthroughs in general intelligence. Yes. Let's see how this goes. Okay, strange membranes are phonating confidently. I'm completed the lesson. I take a look at the back of the vocabulary module card and the notes they're written by administrators of the past. Hello, part of vocabulary and vocalization module A2, conversational basics, general pronunciation comments, sloppy articulation module comments, see below. We are already encountering some difficulty as Whiskers' subjectivity is so much determined by a diverse and dynamic array of influences. It attempts to min mimic the thoughts and desires it passively intercepts, and these imitations go on to structure the basis of its identity. Only later in Whiskers' growth cycle does it begin to form an identity, or identities that are coherent and capable of resembling a sane, rational human being when engaged in conversation. One must imagine how hard it would be to converse to someone who is not yet oriented in one particular way towards who or how they are, because they might have 20 different honest answers to those questions, all of them mixed and muddled together. Because of this, we have started with the basics of conversation. Greetings, paint partings, identifying one another, forming questions, etc., etc. It is fortunate Whiskers' current growth, number 19, I believe, has developed a mostly accurate human mouth simulation. Hello was a bit of a challenge in the previous growth as it failed to develop an adequate organ to act as a human tongue. And that, that'll get you. That'll get you every time. Okay, so what this is saying is that if we do a good enough job, uh, this thing will literally eventually grow into our grandpa. So it, it'll work. It'll work. One out of two talk taught. Let's, uh... Teach another word. Grandpa. Grandpa is eager to learn. Something that's not quite apparent is it's a little difficult to move the cursor around as the game keeps dragging it back to the center of the pentagram. 
So there is some resistance as I am moving it around. All right, M membranes are phonating. Close enough. All right, notes. Grandpa, part of vocabulary and vocalization module E81, family, general pronunciation comments, usual trouble with articulation, voice thin slash raspy, possibly underdeveloped larynx, module comments see below. We have done several sessions of what we are calling familial relation simulation. I and a co-researcher sit in chairs opposite the enclosure. We are wearing the usual masks, and we begin to act out a scene, mostly through improvisation that might roughly resemble a kitchen table conversation between an immediate family. Repeated trials would reveal, although our simulated conversation was purposely vague and unspecific regarding persons and identities, we would only address each other as brother, father, sister, etc., etc., it soon became apparent that the encoded information and associations we unconsciously drawn upon when hearing and speaking these words was picked up on by whiskers and its psi type field of reception slash interpretation of brain slash mind events slash semantic content. My co-researcher, William, noticed this in the simulation where Whiskers was given a role as a sister, and he as a brother, I was the father. Whiskers began responding to certain prompts with unusual specificity, as well as a general pattern and timbre of speech that continued with unusual consistency. Uh-oh, that's where William, that's where he started getting a problem. Oh no, that sounds just like my sister. Maybe it could be my sister if I tried hard enough. Hey, is there a person you want to exist? Just, you know, spend some time with this thing. As soon as the simulation ended and we left the enclosure area, William let me know that Whiskers was almost certainly drawing from encoded memories of his late sister. Mapping out exactly what regions and centers of neural activity are intercepted by the site type field will take extensive neuroimaging that we do not have at this site. Currently, we only have less precise portable equipment. However, our experiences so far are eerily in line with folk knowledge and folk explanations regarding the being's access to desires. And we can begin to infer it as access to certain portions of the limbic system and the ventral temporal cortex. We step away. All right, we have educated and fed grandpa. Uh, let's observe. I examine grandpa, noting movements, respiration, general mood. He appears content and ready to cooperate. Let me look at the stomach contents. There, oh, he got, he ate a key. I could explore more of the basement with this. Thanks, Grandpa. I guess that was William's. William's key. Let's see what William, uh, had the key for. Let's communicate with Grandpa. Grandpa accedes to my request. It approaches the bars and begins to unknit its skin. Oh, you don't actually need to do all that, Grandpa. The, the inner grandpa, though still not fully formed, is revealed. It may be fruitful to speak with it, if it can be respond. If it can respond. Ah, the inner grandpa. Ba ask about wish. With a great deal of effort, grandpa gurgles fragmented thoughts through its ill-formed lips. <laughs> <laughs> the dark spiny filaments that make up the majority of Grandpa's body begin to oscillate rapidly. <laughs> we're, we're bonding with Grandpa. What about Grandpa's shell? Okay, tell me about it. Scream my father on the wants more skin. What about the biohazard bin? It produces it fails to produce more than a wet and frustrated sputtering noise. Can't talk about the biohazard bin yet. Goodbye, Grandpa! He ascends back into his shell. Alright, he wants more skin. 
we should save a game. Game saved. And that we can end the week. Weekly summary. Food acquired, battery, blueberries, fiberglass insulation, cashews, lettuce, banana, concealed insulation. Many documents. Knowledge I acquired have given me new conversation topics. Language. And uh, week two is done. And with that, our hour-long tryout of Growing My Grandpa is done. Well, this is an intriguing thing. Um, Adrienne is, doesn't, is not satisfied with her home life. Mom and dad are, you know, arguing and not uh, giving her enough love and attention. And apparently they live in a house that has been... Pre the previous occupants were conducting some sort of experiment on some sort of strange, uh, unknown being that wants to grow and mimic, but every time it did, the researchers would kill it and then restart, because you don't want it to get too advanced and too dangerous. Those researchers are gone now, though, but the thing still remains, so now Adrian just wants her grandpa back, and fortunately for her, uh, this thing can apparently become her grandpa, given enough time and love. So, that's, uh, that's our tryout of growing, growing my grandpa. Will Adrienne be able to fully grow grandpa? And what kind of person will grandpa be? Well, I mean, it seems like the type of person it would become is based on the person who's growing it. Will it be a good grandpa full of love? Or a bad grandpa full of hate? I don't know. But uh, I guess that's up to Adrienne. See how good of a job she does with raising the uh, thing in the basement. The, the proto-grandpa. Pre-grandpa. It's not quite grandpa yet. It'll eventually be grandpa.